and welcome to Superb Women Sundays at 7. I'm your host, Janet Neal, the founder and queen bee at the Superb Women Incorporated. I am very happy that you've joined us tonight. We have, of course, just another amazing Superb Woman. And before we get to Mary, let me tell you a little bit about the Superb Woman. I started the Superb Woman with the belief that women can change this world when they realize that they have the power to do so. I believe that every woman has incredible power and so many of us don't understand that we have that power or are giving our power away. And so the purpose of the Superb Woman is to provide the training, the resources, the opportunities for women to access their power. And when I talk about power, I'm not talking about any kind of political power or organizational power. I'm talking about personal power. I'm talking about that connection with your spirit, what makes you unique. And when you are aligned with that, oof, watch out. I know you know women who you just are so attracted to because of their energy. They're so positive. They are doing amazing things because they are comfortable in their own skin. They seem to have aligned with who they are. I mean, think of Oprah. She's a classic example of a superb woman, somebody who's really taken the time to understand who she is, what's important to her, and has crafted and is living a life that supports all of that. And I am fortunate enough to keep running into superb women. And I'm so grateful to bring them on as guests of my show to be able to show you just what a superb woman is. These are women that are doing amazing things. And it's not because of what they're doing, it's about who they are. It's about being themselves. It's all about the being. And Mary Robinson is no exception to this rule. I met Mary at a um, executive women's networking event. Um, she did a presentation there that was phenomenal and just really, her energy was amazing. It really showed to me, I, I'm watching her going, oh yeah, superb woman. So I'm so excited to have her here. She is the founder and executive director of Imagine, a center for coping with loss for children in Westfield, New Jersey. She also is the founder and a former executive director of Good Grief, another um, grief organization. And Mary's been involved in the field of grief support since 1997. So Mary, welcome to our show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, I'm so glad that you could make it. So Mary, tell us your story. How did you become involved in this whole field of children's grief support? Well, uh, I was actually thinking about this and that it really started 41 years ago when I was 14 and my father died. Um, I was a freshman at Madison High School and my brother was a sophomore at the time. And my dad had been diagnosed with cancer um, a year and a half before he died. And I really think that that was the start of my journey into this field because I was um, a child who did not get support um, that was needed. So I always say that I do this work now to ensure that other children don't lose years of their life to unresolved grief, which is what happened to me and my brother. Mm -hmm. um, my mom had been a stay-at-home mom. And when my dad was diagnosed with cancer, we, he had just changed jobs and didn't have medical insurance. Mm -hmm. So we were really kind of wiped out financially. Um, I, grew, I was growing up in Madison, attending Madison High School. And my mom was, um, speaking of superb women, a really extraordinarily resilient person. And she went and got her license in real estate because she realized she was going to have to raise us on her own and wanted to be able to keep the house and pay the bills, send us to college. And um, she did a, a wonderful job. You know, she was successful. You know, she is really who made my life possible. Um, my brother and I were less resilient than our mom at the time, and we kind of fell through the cracks and acted out in ways typical of grieving children. You know, for myself, I, you know, my grades went down. Um, I quit the track team. 
I quit the school newspaper, I really started isolating myself and ended up getting really depressed kind of into my 20s. Mm. And so, you know, and that didn't need to be so. But back then, you know, that long ago, schools really didn't know how to support grieving children and teens. They didn't know what to say or what to do. And fortunately, we've come a long way since then. So fast forward, um, I worked in the corporate world for 14 years at Prudential Financial, and that's where I first got actually exposed really to the nonprofit sector. My last five years at Prudential, I was in corporate community relations and working closely with nonprofits. And I decided um, I wanted to go work for a different bottom line. I wanted to work more closely in the community. And I had been fortunate to be um, involved on a board of trustees of a children's grief support organization. It was an international nonprofit and I was on the board of the local chapter. And when I discovered their mission, that there actually existed something to help grieving children, I was blown away. I remember crying tears of gratitude in my car when I discovered this organization and that I was gonna be able to be of service to them and to help. Oh, wait, let me stop you there. So did you, you just decided to get involved with this organization and you had no idea what they did? Oh no, they came to Prudential looking for a grant. Wow. Yeah, and, and one of my, part of my job in corporate community relations was grant making and giving out grants to small area nonprofits here in New Jersey. And they had applied for a grant. And um, actually I first discovered them uh, at a centering prayer group. I went and a member of the board was at that group. And when she heard I worked for Prudential, she said, you know, I want to tell you about an organization. I want you, I want you to come to an information session and learn about them. And kind of the rest is history. I went, um, I joined their board. We ended up making the grant. And um, a year later, I uh, left Prudential to work full time in the field of children's grief support. I became the executive director of that organization. Um, and then from there, I ended up um, leaving to start Good Grief because I saw that so much more could be done to serve grieving children and uh, discovered this model out in Portland, Oregon and that didn't exist yet in New Jersey. And, mm -hmm. uh, and New Jersey is the most densely populated state, and yet we didn't have a single year-round children's grief support center. Wow. 20,000 children a year in New Jersey have a parent die every single year. And yet there was no dedicated support for them. <laughs> so um, started Good Grief, which was based on that model. There's about 500 centers like, like it around the country. And then I went back to school and got my master's degree because I wanted to really learn even more about child development and family systems and why we suffer and how we could suffer less. And <laughs> I had gone on my own journey of healing, you know, after um, losing my dad and really... Um, not living up to my potential, you know, for years. So did a lot of personal work and then, you know, got to this point in my life where I could now be of service to um, other grieving families and children. So after I graduated, um, this incredible gentleman, Dr. Jerry Glasser, who I had known for a number of years, asked me if I would come to Westfield and open a center. Um, his son had died on September 11th and left behind a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And oh he felt like there was a huge need in the area um, because we had moved Good Grief to Morristown from Summit and here we had left a void in the Westfield area. So he, he invited me to come there and I had the, you know, really the privilege of um, going to Westfield and starting Imagine, a center for coping with loss. And I call it Imagine, you know, we call it Imagine because a child's imagination is one of their built-in coping tools, like along with their cognition. Their imagination helps them solve problems and make sense of their loss and kind of make sense of the world. And it's also because I wanted children and families to, and, and the people in their lives after they've had a loss, to imagine a future of possibility and hope. Because everybody had heard the statistics, kids in grief are kids at risk. You know, they're at risk for not doing well in school, for drug and alcohol abuse, and but not if they get support. So, um, so I forget where I was going with that. <laughs> so um, imagine you were talking about the why you you were talking about the kids' imagination is what yes um, right. So we wanted all these adults in their lives to also hold the optimism and the hope for these grieving kids. 
-hmm. that they are that they could have a life where they could live up to their potential and grow up emotionally healthy and not lose years of their life <clears throat> and that the future could be optimistic and hopeful and full of possibility so that's where the name came from that's wonderful so when did you open in westfield so we opened uh, may 7th 2012 so I think it was two weeks ago, we had our three-year anniversary of providing direct services. And we're currently serving 212 children and parents from 48 New Jersey towns. So families are traveling from all over to get to us. And we also yeah. provide education. So in addition to the direct service, we have a clinical training director who goes out into the community and into schools and into agencies and into workplaces to raise awareness about the impact of grief and loss on kids and what we as the adults in their lives can do to support them when they're grieving. And also to raise awareness simply about, about this thing called grief. You know, we really live in a, a death denying and grief avoiding society. And, you know, we want to create really, you know, kind of what we call good morning communities, you know, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, hmm. where we don't, you know, avoid people who are grieving. I can't tell you how many times someone has said after someone in their family has died, they've lost a child or a spouse, where people avoid them in the grocery store. So right. what we're trying to do is create communities, these resilient communities that, that know how to support not just children, but, but adults, and where we don't run away from people out of fear or discomfort, and where we embrace them and support them and listen to them. So the education piece of what we do is also really essential. And um, one of the, the pieces of the education that's important is we don't just talk about loss due to death because kids grieve loss of all kinds, as do we as adults. Mm -hmm. They say that there's one out of three children in every classroom who's grieving a loss at any given time, whether due to death or divorce or separation, mm -hmm. parental incarceration, not making the team, their best friend, you know, ostracizing them. Because, um, right. A friend moving. There's there's all these losses we experience. It's just part of life and part of being human. Mm -hmm. But nobody teaches kids how to deal with with the emotions that go along with that. And yet we we focus on kids and say we want everybody to do well academically. And what we need to say back to the teachers and the schools is if we don't help kids deal with their emotional lives, they're not going to do well academically. They're not going to be able to focus and concentrate and. So uh, the education piece of what we do, we're, we're really um, passionate about as well. I, I applaud you for what you do and, and so, so know that what you're saying is absolutely true. And when I was a teacher, that was, that was paramount to be able to reach a child emotionally and get them emotionally stable so that they are in a learning environment where they are able to take in the learning. So kudos to you guys for doing that. Thank you. So let me ask you a question. Um, you know, you bring up a very good point about, um, you know, our society does not handle grief well. We tend to kind of push it aside and, and, and you know, we don't go there. And, um, and a lot of people, I, I just saw an article recently, a lot of people do avoid talking to someone who's, who's just suffered a loss because they do not know what to say. Mm -hmm. So especially with children, what do you recommend? What would be like three things that, that you would recommend people do? So um, we always say, you know, just check in. Like if it's a child, just first of all, acknowledge their loss. You know, one of the things that happens is everybody avoids the topic because mm -hmm. they don't want to make them more sad. And we're like, they're already sad. You're not right. going to remind them. It's on their mind all the time. So right. we say, let the child know, you know, how sorry you are that they lost their, their mom or their dad. Um, and if you have a story about the person, like, I remember your mom made the best chocolate chip cookies, or, you know, your dad told the funniest stories. So kids like to hear, and we do as adults as well, we want to hear the person's name who has died, we want to hear a story about them, a memory shared. Um, and then we, we just say, how, how are you doing? Um, sometimes the child's not going to want to talk, uh, especially right. teenagers. So we say, just let them know you're there. And um, I always call it knocking on the door of their heart to keep checking back in. And um, some things that you can do are just write the child a note. One of the things I have to this day, I received one sympathy card from an adult after my father died and I still have it. And that note and what she wrote in it gave me hope that something good would come out of the loss. 
know, she said to me, Mary, you know, I see you on your way to school every day, and I know this is such a painful time in your life, but I know also that these things help children grow up more compassionate and empathic. So it sort of like gave me the idea that something good would come from it. So I always say to adults, write kids a note, let them know that you see them and that you, you get that their loss matters and that you're there for them. No. The research shows that one of the most important things a grieving child needs is at least one caring functional adult in their life who sees them, who gets it, and who pays attention. Mm. Give them your love, give them your time, and give them your optimism that they're gonna get through it. Mm. But be available. So we say one, one is good, more is better. So aunts and uncles, and, and the reason these other adults are so important is when a spouse has had a, their spouse die, when a parent has had a spouse die or a child die, despite their best of intentions and their desire to help their children, they're so grieving themselves that they're just not emotionally as available. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, that the key thing is to, it, it's not always what you say either, it's about how you're being, how you be with the person. And that's really about really being present and being what we call a loving listener. We actually do a four day training to train volunteers how to facilitate our support groups and be with children and adults. And um, we teach them how to listen really, you know, and to allow the person to say what they need to say and not interrupt with our story or pressing for details, but to really be a compassionate witness to them um, through their loss. Beautiful. So what are the kinds of things you do with the children there in your location? Sure. So the, the kids, we serve children ages 3 to 18, and they meet in small groups no larger than 10 with other children in their same developmental age. And in the groups, every week there's an activity designed to help them, you know, share their feelings, share memories, tell their story, um, and basically to not keep their feelings bottled up inside. So we do arts and crafts. Um, there's games. We have something called the Volcano Room, which is a place where two children at a time from each of the different ages, age groups can go. And it's a place for physical activity, for really discharging the kinetic energy in the body. To um, So when you get rid of that energy that's attached to emotion, then you can more easily talk about what's going on. So basically, the kids, so the younger children, the younger participants play, because play is children's work. Just like their imagination, play is how they learn about the world and make sense of their loss and kind of integrate it into their life. Because they don't yet have the vocabulary, especially the young children. And then the teenagers typically sit and talk the whole time. Um, every group starts with their own opening ritual and closing ritual. The parents also sit and talk the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. Every so often, one will go to the volcano room. Um, every so often, wow. they, may, they may do the activity, but it's really, you know, for the teens and the parents, it's all talk. We also, we start the evening with a pizza supper. So it's one less thing a family has to worry about, you know, kind of picking up the kids, getting to imagine, you know, dinner is taken care of. So it's a chance for the family to catch their breath, not worry about how to, you know, get dinner um, and to really be there in community with all the other families. And then we do an opening circle. Um, so picture 60 people in the room, children from three to 18, young adults, parents, and we, ha we pass a talking stick. And that's a very important ritual where people name their loss. They name, they say who they are, and then they say who died. And so it's, it's powerful because the participants, the little kids get like, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one whose mom died. There's that big kid over there and that person, everybody. Uh, I tell this story. I was waiting for um, the pizza to be delivered one night and a grandfather arrived with his three grandchildren. Both of their parents had died, so he took he was taking care of them. And he came over to me, they were early, I was waiting for the pizza to be delivered, and one of his grandchildren, the eight-year-old, was just really glued to his side, and he came over to me and said, you know, how did you get involved in this work? And I said, well, you know, when I was a kid, my father died. And his little grandson looked up at me and said, hey, you know what's really cool about this place? And I was like, what? What's really cool about this place? And he said, everybody said somebody who died. And I uh -huh. said, That's what's really cool. So he got it. I'm not alone. And this is normal. So it normalizes it, that, that opening ritual and being in community and then going into your separate support groups. And the kids see their parents going off and getting support so that then they're like, 
You know, I don't have to worry about mom right now. Right. So a lot of what happens in the home is that everybody's protecting one another. You know, the parents don't want to have the kids see them sad and the kids don't want to have the parents see them sad. So nobody's talking. And often, you know, when they come to imagine for the first time and have their orientation, often it's the first time that they're talking together as a family and sharing about the loss and their, and their grief. Wow. Wow. That's so powerful, Mary. It's, and so beautiful at the same time. So, Mary, who has helped you on your path? I'm, I know that, you know, we none of us can do it alone, but I know that especially with your story, you must have had some really special people who have helped you. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I have an incredible network of uh, friends who um, are just, you know, really incredibly important in my life. Obviously, my mom, my mom has, has since died, but she is, I think of something she said, she was a great businesswoman, and I apply her wisdom almost every day at the office. Um, and I have to say, you know, uh, my therapist, you know, I really was having a tough time early in my adult life. And um, because there was nothing, there was no grief support. I thought I was the only one at that age who didn't have a dad, which is crazy when I think about it at 14 to have that thought. So um, a really powerful therapist, and and um, I'm actually continuing in school uh, in applied psychoanalysis to get my certification. And I would say that my school community and being in ongoing analysis myself is extraordinarily supportive, and you know helps me live my life uh, to the fullest, and also. Um, know that anything's possible and you know, I've kind of learned that through my journey and through my spiritual journey. Um, lovely, lovely. Yeah. So we had talked before about um, the word should and the word should is something that contains a lot of guilt. It, it kind of uh, holds people back and so I have found that superb women have learned to let go of should. So what's one should that you have released? I feel like I have released almost all the shoulds in my life. Um, I've, but related to grief, um, since that's our topic, I feel like the shoulds I've let go of how are, um, I should be over it by now. Mm -hmm. um, that's a huge one that's put on people who are grieving. Aren't you over it yet? Shouldn't you be, you know, doing better? Mm -hmm. And there's no time frame to grief. So um, actually when my mom died six years ago, I was, you know, I was, I was devastated and um, I didn't realize what a huge loss that was going to be. I figured, well, that's the natural order. You know, she was older, I'm older. But um, it took me almost three years to really feel like I had my feet back on solid ground and that my full brain capacity was back. And luckily, having done this work, I knew it's okay. There's no should be over it. Take the time that you need. Grieve the way that you need to grieve. That's what we try to communicate to everybody who comes to imagine. You know, grief is so idiosyncratic. It's so personal and unique to each person and to each loss. So, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Very good advice. Um, and I just want to remind our viewers out there that if you do have a question for Mary, please go ahead and type that in on your screens and we'll get that over to her. Um, and for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, if you do have questions for her, please send me or Mary herself an email. Um, her contact information will be on a slide at the end of this, um, and we'll be sure to get you the answers for that. So Mary, tell us what's next. I know that right now you guys are in a church location, but you're looking to get your own place? Yes, so we are renting space at First United Methodist Church in Westfield. Like a lot of the centers around the country that start up, um, a church or a house of worship, a temple, is often a great location because they have large buildings that aren't really being used that much during the week. So we were so fortunate that the church, um, First United Methodist Church, gave us space. You know, we, we pay rent, um, but you know, never could have afforded to have our, our own dedicated space. The challenge though is we're outgrowing this space. Like I said, you know, 212 children and growing, um, currently coming to imagine on four different nights of support. And we'll be out of space by the end of the year. So we are launching a new space campaign um, this year. 
and we're actually going to announce it at our upcoming Imagine a World breakfast event. Uh, and the theme is a center of our own. So that's breakfast event is June 4th, and we're going to be looking for space. We need about 10,000 square feet of space uh, to run this program, nine different breakout breakout rooms, the large room for the eating and a training room. So it, it takes a lot of space plus the parking space. So if anybody oh. has any ideas, we're, we're open to <laughs> corporate space, a big old house, a warehouse that we can convert. Are you looking any place in particular, just in the New Jersey, central New Jersey area? Well, we're going to stay in Union County. I mean, we have, we're very committed to, if we can't stay in Westfield, um, to at least stay around or nearby Westfield because of our, you know, the, the Dr. Glasser who provided the startup funding has, has, and his foundation has continued to fund us each year. Um, so it's really to, in honor of his legacy and the fact that he wanted this in his community where he was born and raised. So uh, his philanthropy is all about making sure that the community of Westfield and the surrounding areas are well cared for. So we're definitely staying in, in the area. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So tell us your event that you have coming up on the 4th. Tell us a little bit more about that. That's our annual, it's a fundraising breakfast, but it's free to attend. It's one hour long. It's 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. at La Fair on Route 22 in Mountainside. And at the event, we show a video about Imagine that includes, you know, families speaking about their experience and volunteers. We also have a testimonial from a family who comes and shares their story. And uh, then I'll speak and talk about our vision for the future, what's happened up, up till now. And at the end of this one hour program, we then ask people to consider making a donation. There'll be about 400 people there. Um, it's sponsored by a number of wonderful businesses so that um, all of the money raised at this event will go directly to supporting our programs. Uh, we love the, you know, the, this breakfast model because I think it's very respectful, first of all, of people's time, and it also allows us to powerfully share what our mission is. So we don't say to our board members, go ask all your friends you know, for a check for your charity. We say, tell them about what we do and invite them to come and learn about us. And if it speaks to the person and they want to give, and, and it's really about investing in the community. You know, Do they want to invest in this vision and mission that we have? So there's so many good causes we're really looking for people that this speaks to personally. Um, and and the, the reason grief support is so important is because, you know, we want those children to not be, you know, dealing with unresolved grief and having it inhibit their lives, inhibit them from living fully um, and going out into the world and making a difference. You know, I say, you know, whether it's, you know, going out and working to solve hunger or homelessness or simply raising good children themselves and becoming the next generation of healers for children in grief, that next generation of wise adults who can be there for grieving children. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And we will have um, also a sl on the slide, we'll have more information for you in case you're interested in attending that, um, that event on the 4th. So Mary, I just want to thank you so much for being my guest today. I just applaud you again for the work that you're doing. It is so important. And I'm very grateful that you joined us tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And next week is Memorial Day. So we're taking the day off. Um, but the week after that, this will be a really interesting one. Um, Victoria is going to be my guest. And she is a gypsy nester. She and her husband sold their home and live on the road, and they travel literally the world and blog about it. Um, so I'm sure you're going to want to tune in and find out, you know, just how does she did it? Does it? <laughs> Why did she do it? Um, and find out more about her as a superb woman. So until then, have just a fabulous couple of weeks. Take care. <laughs>